Right. Uh, Ella Paul works at the um, uh, uh, National Museum of Antiquities in Scotland as part of the uh, treasure trove uh, team. And um, she's going to tell us about, um, in the treasure trove unit, she's going to tell us about, um, I've lost her. Yes, no, there she is. Yes, right. Good, great. Um, she's going to tell us about uh, treasure trove, uh, um, tre uh, seals in uh, Scotland, uh, look at sealing, sealing practices. Now, um, the Scottish treasure trove system, as I expect you all, all know, is rather different from the English treasure trove system. And in many ways, it's actually better. Um, and uh, it's possible that there may be reforms in the next year or two, which will bring the English system using more of the definitions of treasure that are used in Scotland. If, if that happens, it will um, possibly have an impact on the um, uh, study of seals in, in, in the future, study of English seals, not Scottish seals. But what we're going to hear about now from um, Ella is the Scottish seal, seals and what they tell us about sealing practices. Right, so over to you, Ella. Thank you, John, that's very kind. I'll just share my screen. Okay. So thank you very much, John, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak today. I'll be taking you on, um, I'm afraid, a bit of a whirlwind tour for the next 20, 25 minutes of uh, treasure trove uh, seal matrix data, what I think it might be able to tell us, and where the potential is for future research as well. I'm aware we have um, an international audience, so I'll lay some of the groundwork just to start. Uh, what is treasure trove? Well, John gave a nice introduction. Um, it is the legal framework for managing portable antiquities found in Scotland. And it operates on a Scots common law principle of bona vacantia. Bona vacantia uh, roughly, not exactly, translates as ownerless goods, um, of which portable antiquities form a subset. It can be quite complex, but it essentially, it means that all objects, regardless of age, material, or object type, must be reported um, to the treasure trove unit and may be claimed as treasure trove by the Crown and allocated to a museum in Scotland, or otherwise disclaimed and returned to the finder. Um, there are no um, restrictions on what may be claimed, so it could be something of lead, um, a textile, something of precious metal, a hoard, a single find, chance find, excavation, all comes through treasure trove. It's at this point I have to stipulate, um, as a matter of course, the Treasure Act of 1996 does not apply to Scotland. Um, it is treasure trove law instead. And the system is managed on a day-to-day -day basis by the treasure trove unit. And you can see the team just on the right. It's a small team, just three of us. We have remit for the entirety of Scotland, mainland as well as the islands. Um, each with their own specialisms. So Sophie on the right is our newest team member who focuses on prehistoric lithics. I'm working on seal matrices. And Emily on the left, treasure trove manager, um, has an interest in Roman coins. If you would like more information, we have a new revamped website. So please give us a visit um, or get in touch with us. But one of the object types we uh, record frequently and also claim frequently, and this is the point that John was coming to, um, is the sometimes but not always humble seal matrix. Um, and because they are regularly claimed and allocated to museums, we have this corpus of seal matrices over the decades that are sitting in Scottish museums around the country, which we can go and access and uh, research. So what's been written now, if you listen to Elizabeth News' wonderful uh, talk last week, um, and Rachel Davis's talk just now, um, Scottish seals do feature in late 19th and early 20th century catalogues. So Lang, uh, Walter de Grey Birch, um, a bit later Stevenson and Wood. The focus of these is quite elite. Um, it's, it's seals and uh, seal matrices and seal impressions of people and institutions deemed important at the time. 
In more recent decades, the broader straight questions have been asked uh, predominantly of English material culture, and that's partly um, in response to the inaccessibility of the Scottish material uh, culture and the Scottish data, specifically the treasure trove data. Um, so it was, a, uh, it was nice for a new, relative newcomer to the field to come across the seals in medieval Wales project and see some of the questions they were demanding of their data. It's not to say there has been no uh, research on Scottish seals. On the contrary, there's plenty out of there and this is just a small selection. So on the top right, you can see a publication by Virginia Glenn. Um, decorative metal work in the collections of National Museums Scotland. Um, it's the several seal matrices, they're all quite high status. Um, and it approaches from more of an art historical perspective than an archeological one, for example. Mark Hall, um, bottom right of Perth Museum and Art Gallery, has published on two seal matrices that were, that were allocated to Perth by a treasure trove, so two medieval men of Strathern. Um, and in the early 90s, David Caldwell uh, published on a particular type of seal matrix of the 16th and early 17th centuries in Scotland. And of course, most recently, you just heard from her, Dr. Mer uh, Rachel Meredith Davis, looking at women's seals. But I think it's fair to say there has been no attempt to consider a national picture of sealing practices in late medieval Scotland thus far. And that got us thinking. And by us, um, I have to extend my thanks to my colleague at National Museum Scotland, uh, Dr. Alice Blackwell, who really provided some of the impetus for these, these very early questions. Um, and we set out initially to do three things. So first was to re-identify all of the seal matrices recorded by the Treasure Trove Unit. Some of these had images, some of them didn't. Uh, some of them had an identification of a legend or a motif. Some of them didn't again. Um, so it's really quite a mixed bag. We then started to re-record the data um, in a high-tech Excel spreadsheet. And the benefit of this was to make it a comprehensive data set all in one place. The Treasure Trove database incorporates, um, incorporates all object types, of course. And the benefit of, of uh, pulling out this data by itself was that we could include uh, object specific fields, such as motif type, owner for classification. This is quite an early example, um, but you can see the benefits. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, and most long-term, we're seeking to reinterpret this as a comprehensive data set within a Scottish context. So not a regional or a local, but a national context. Um, and additionally, eventually, in a, in a wider British and Irish context. So what do we have? Well, if you're familiar with the Portable Antiquity, uh, Antiquity Scheme data, you'll realise it's quite a small data set. We've recorded over 120 so far. There are more to be added. Um, the data set currently uh, comprises data from the late 90s to 2019. There are data from... Um, the last year that we've not been able to record yet owing to the pandemic and there are data predating the late 90s that just need a bit more digging into paper archives for example. Um, we think a total we we're looking about 150 or 160 um, and it is very much tip of the iceberg stuff and um, it only includes seal matrices recorded by the treasure trove unit it does not include um, everything else so historic museum acquisitions so acquisitions that haven't come through treasure trove and there are various reasons for this excavated examples and um, we don't have too many they do come through treasure trove but i'm only dealing with the chance finds so far those seals in private collections and I'm, I'm, I should have explained at the start, I'm using seal um, interchangeably between seal matrix and seal impression at the moment. Um, and of course, the impressions on datable documents, which are crucial for us answering any big chronological questions. In terms of data recording methods, it's been um, somewhat ad hoc over the last two centuries. The earliest seal matrix we have claimed by the Crown is in 1833. It was uh, found in 1832, just the year before, in central Edinburgh, just off the Royal Mile. It bears the lamb and pennon, the Agnes Day, uh, with a personal legend. And it's interesting to note that in the mid 19th century, that association between the lamb and the pennon was to um, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. And I suggest that this is an example that would not have been claimed by the Crown in 1833 if they thought it was a seal of a, of a lesser individual, for example. 
It's one that resides in the National Museum's collection. Um, and you can see the reference number at the bottom there. Um, it's one that I've not managed to see yet, but I will hope to once I regain access. Um, I should also thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark, who's done a lot of the early research into, um, into the development of treasure trove, um, especially in the 19th century. We also have a list of claims. So claimed items that have gone into museums through treasure trove from 1912 to 2010. Um, our digital records in terms of a database didn't begin until 2010. Um, and that's the form of an access database, which is free text. So um, incredibly useful and a much, um, a, a really good move away from a paper archive, but as free text, quite difficult to search and pull out comprehensive data from. And I'm delighted to say that um, this year we have a forthcoming public database, which will publish this data. It will be searchable and accessible, and it will include the seal matrices as well. So in terms of preliminary findings, um, in no particular order, I thought I'd start with women. We have very, very, very few women named in legends um, of the CMHCs recorded by the Treasure Trove Unit. It's just 2%, um, and that's, that's three in total. So I can talk you through them now. The first is one that I will come back to. It's a Vesica seal matrix, copper alloy. It's the seal of Isabella de Sterling. And the motif is one I'll come back to as well. It's the martyrdom of St. Catherine of Alexandria. And I will discuss that in more detail. The second is similar in form and material, copper alloy, vesica. It's a seal of Agnes de Fenton, and the motif here is, um, is, is more standard. It's a pelican in her piety. And we have just one more, which is altogether later in date. Um, it is the seal of Margaret. We've lost um, the second part of the legend. The motif is a, is a shield. It appears to be blank. It's unclear whether this was unfinished and discarded or um, or the decoration wasn't required for whatever reason and then destroyed afterwards. Um, it's also unclear whether the matrix was bent and then straightened out after it was recovered. In terms of legends type, um, of those matrices with legible legends, which is about half of the data set, but I expect this is to improve as we improve accessibility to the data. Um, overwhelmingly, we have personal legends. So legends naming an individual, 84%. We have very, very few anonymous legends at all. It's just eight in total, and this is all of them. We have one that um, appears twice, so there's seven in total. One in French, one in English, and then the rest in Latin. Um, two invocations of Jesus, um, and three more standard anonymous legends at the top. We also have two within the data set that have institutional legends, and I'll discuss just one of them here. And it's interesting to follow the three of Castle example um, that Dr. Davis just mentioned. This is, or at least appears to be, one half of a cocket seal for use in a press. So it's the royal half. The legend um, mentions James VI by the grace of God, King of Scots, and the royal shield is in the centre there. Um, at first glance, it's unusual. First of all, it's a bit messy. The legend doesn't quite complete the circumference of the die face. One of the perforations in the lugs is slightly off center and there are tooling marks as well on the lugs and on the uh, reverse of the die as well. Um, the initial thought was that perhaps this was a forgery, but actually on closer inspection, it seems that this is um, unlikely. And the main reason for that is that it's entirely unconvincing. And um, the central motif isn't particularly well drawn, um, but most importantly, the material type is entirely inappropriate. For use in a press, you want something like a copper alloy, a bronze or a brass. Um, lead is very hard to stand up to that kind of scrutiny. And when you look at the looks in closer detail, actually there's very little sign of them being used in a press in that way. Um, so the discussion um, that I had with Dr. Alice Blackwell and David Caldwell, formerly of National Museum Scotland, was that perhaps here we're looking at a trial piece or a test piece and a cheap, um, easily engraved metal but it's one still up for discussion. In terms of dating, we have, um, it was quite reassuring last week to hear Laura Burnett mention the 15th century gap. It's a problem in our data set um, that has come about for one of two reasons. First is the way we've recorded data in the past, and I'm talking back decades and decades. Seal matrices in the treasure trove data set are either recorded as 13th, 14th century or 16th, 17th century. 
there's no 15th century in our data and it's compounded by the fact that we don't know what we're looking for. Um, it might be something that is, is solvable when we compare it to datable material, so seal impressions attached to documents. Um, but there is a problem of, of data bias there, of course. The treasure trade data more readily um, offers seals of, of people of middling to lower status. The archival material is, is the other way. So it's the problem that we've had historically recording this data um, and also that we don't know what we're looking for. We have a few candidates, but it's, it's quite difficult. Um, to say anything more about it at the moment. We do on occasion have identifiable individuals um, who are closely datable. And this is a really good example. Uh, this is the seal of William de Lamberton, who was Bishop of St. Andrews um, from the 1290s to the 1320s. Uh, we don't have an impression of this particular seal surviving, but we do have an impression of a much larger seal matrix, um, which is very, very similar in design and the use of the heraldic arms as well. Um, so we're happy with the association and we're happy with the date as well, but these are few and far between. And actually to answer broad chron chronological questions, as I said, we need that datable material as well. So that's a much bigger project. In terms of material choice for seal matrices, um, this is a bit of a crude graph, um, but I think it displays what it needs to. We have a strong predominance for copper alloy. In the 13th and 14th centuries, we have very, very few lead seals. Um, that was something that really um, shot, kind of uh, shouted out to me when I was comparing it to the, the data in England and Wales, their seal matrix data, that actually there, there are a lot of lead alloy seals, and we have two or three. But we see this complete shift um, into the 16th and 17th centuries, and we see this uh, predominance instead of lead alloy. And one of the reasons for that is that we start to see a very particular type of Scottish seal matrix um, being used at that time. And that is this one. I'm calling it the flower type for um, an obvious reason. The stalk um, handle on the reverse is, is like the stalk of a flower. And then it splays out onto the reverse of the die into petal formations. They are molded sometimes, sometimes they're engraved. The die face is always circular. Um, the motif is almost always a shield with a round bottom. The uh, legend is almost always a personal legend in black letter or Latin capital script. Uh, David Caldwell has published on these. Um, the initial data set I think was only seven or eight. Uh, we have more to add now. And some of the compositional analysis that he undertook as part of that paper was to suggest that actually these are alloyed with tin, presumably to harden them for making impressions. This particular example um, identifies Thomas Gray, and the heraldry suggests a link to the, the Greys of Heaton in Northumberland. We also have um, a particularly nice example, which uh, was published last year, and wonderfully, it came up in an excavated context at Dunivegg Castle on Isla. It is the seal of Sir John Campbell of Cawdor and seems to relate to the siege of the castle in the early 17th century. And amazingly, we, we have so, so few of these. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. On the reverse, you have a date in the petals, so 1593. And we also have a maker's mark as well, which seems to be linked to David Milne, um, a goldsmith. Um, that is published. Um, it's in the conference pack, the, the link. And it's on display at the Museum of Isla Life currently, um, while it's, uh, the post-excavation work is being finished and it's declared treasure trove. So out of all of this, um, this kind of broad synthesis of the treasure trove data, came um, a smaller case study um, based on the principle that because we have so many legends that identify individuals um, of our data set, but there's real potential there to have discussions about personal identity, uh, motif choices, especially when you have a personal legend in combination with a non-standard motif. Um, and in 2019, the seal matrix on the screen in front of you was um, reported to us. And it's the one you saw earlier of Isabella de Sterling. Um, the central motif is um, not a generic representation of St. Catherine, but instead um, very specifically her martyrdom for the, the very end of her life. Um, there are lots of studies of late medieval engagement with St. Catherine, and it just sparked my interest. But most of these studies are heavily Anglo-centric, um, and this is because they draw almost always on hagiographical literature, which is almost always written in Middle English. There is no in-depth study of the cult of St. Catherine in late medieval Scotland, as far as I'm aware. 
I think partly this is partly owing to the fact that there is so little literature in terms of saints' lives written in vernacular Scots at the time. Um, and these studies are often at the, uh, the exclusion of material culture. And this is why I think there's real potential. Um, and I sought to identify the types of individuals who are putting um, this particular motif, so St. Catherine of Alexandria, on their field matrices in late medieval Scotland, and further assess how standard the iconography of this example was compared to others. And I have to thank John McEwen for this. Um, he sent over an awful lot of data from the DigiSig archive which I compared and contrasted in terms of visual elements. So whether there was a woman, a sword, um, a wheel, a crown, et cetera, et cetera. Um, basically all you need is a wheel with some spikes. That seems to be the basic enough association or certainly the association that I and um, antiquarians were also making as well. Sometimes you have a woman with the wheel, um, that's quite common. Um, the woman may have a crown, may have a sword, may have a book, but less, less frequently. Um, and quite often you see a woman with a wheel and also a kneeling figure as you've got in the painting on the right. Um, but this one seemed quite special. It seemed quite uh, detailed and it seemed to show a really intimate knowledge of the martyrdom, a particular part of the, of the tale. And if you can see my mouse, you've got the kneeling figure in the center, um, arms raised to receive a crown just here, which is being handed to her by an angelic figure or a heavenly body. Um, the heavenly theme is, is, is um, cemented with the two stars here as well. And then either side of the female body, you have two wheels with very, very clear spikes or blades curving out of the woodwork, um, which is the machine upon which St. Catherine was condemned to die. Um, before they miraculously broke and she was eventually beheaded by a sword which is looming rather ominously behind her head here. This is busier and more detailed than any other example I can find in Britain. Um, it goes beyond the generic representation, it's very specific, it's at the point of her life which is her most palpable point, it's the martyrdom, it's the point at which she, she, she um, distinguishes her life. Um, and it's interesting to think about the legend and how it relates to this motif. And of course, it's speculative. But in terms of um, what might appeal to someone of, called Isabella de Sterling, who appears to be quite high status, not just in terms of the toponymic name, but also in the, um, the fantastic execution, um, pun not intended, of the central motif here. Um, and if we look at the, the crown, being handed by the heavenly body. Now this could have a, a twofold meaning. We, we see in the hagiographical literature that Catherine is very frequently described as of royal descent. So she's a, a princess or a queen of Alexandria. And you can imagine this secular authority must appeal to someone of relatively high status. But also um, the crown of martyrdom, we're in an intensely religious setting here. Um, and that duality of meaning may have appealed both ways to the user of this matrix. We do have two other seals, um, rather simpler. The first on the left is um, a seal matrix of a gentleman called William. Uh, we haven't quite made out his surname uh, or by name yet. The motif is quite interesting. You see the, the Catherine wheel um, as a pseudo heraldic device on a shield with the pennant and cross extending up into the legend. Um, this is something that we see quite often on um, merchant seals or people of that emerging business uh, middling class in the 14th century. And on the right, we have the simplest of the three. Um, it's lead, it's cheap, it's very, very small. We have just the wheel by itself with the spikes emanating from it. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to make out the legend. It might be anon anonymous, but it's really hard to tell. It's another one that we'd like to see closer once things um, um, ease up in terms of the pandemic. In terms of dating, the DigiSig data um, showed a real preference for this emergence of St. Catherine motifs from the 1340s right through to the end of the century, and it drops off quite severely. Um, this is backed up by the Portable Antiquities Scheme data in that of the 19 examples they have, only one names an individual. The others are all anonymous, which lends weight to that 14th century interpretation. There's no reason why it shouldn't be the same for the Scottish data. Of course, we don't have a, as good a backing to make those chronological claims. 
But what we do see is this long, increased longevity of personal um, legends on seal matrices. And that carries through not just to the 14th century, but we see it re-emerging or continuing to emerge, depending on what happens in the 15th, on that flower type seal matrix in the 16th and early 17th century. And it's particularly of note in a, in a period where legend use um, is falling out of fashion um, as, as seals develop south of the border. So really what I've provided um, this afternoon, hopefully, is an overview of the kind of data we have um, very broad, um, as much as I can cram in as possible. They're very much pinch of salt conclusions. It is a, a very much tip of the iceberg data set, and you have to be cautious extrapolating from those kinds of that kind of um, size data set. But I think there's enough here to suggest that there is real potential for future research in terms of the fact that we don't have many women at all. Um, we don't seem to have many lead seals in the 13th and 14th century data. Um, the suggestion that we have, um, well, the fact that we have an entirely Scottish uh, type of seal matrix, which is really, really kind of in use in, with a vengeance in the 16th and early 17th centuries. Um, and I think there's enough here to suggest that there's some exciting research still to be done. And I think there's enough to confirm that we should continue to be cautious um, of applying what we know of seeding practices south of the Anglo-Scottish border and elsewhere in Britain and Ireland to the nation north of it. So I think I'll probably stop there. Um, thank you very much and I'm very happy to take any questions. Right, thank, thank, thank you very much Ella, that, that was uh, marvellous, marvellously to time, lot of information there, <laughs> lot of wise conclusions I thought, absolutely. There is a question from uh, Laura Burnett and Rob Webley. Um, can we ask, are the figures on personal V anonymous based on those claimed or all those which go through the process? Um, that's a really good question. Um, historically, just claims. We don't have fantastic records for objects that were maybe seen in the mid 20th century but not claimed. Um, from 2010 onwards, it's all CMHCs, whether they are claimed or not. Uh, that's that's clear because it, it's it seemed that there were very few anonymous mm. as opposed to personal in, in my sort of general impression of seals that are, are not anonymous seals while they occur north of the border um, aren't really very as common as they are in other areas of England. Um, yeah. Yes, that was something we, we'd heard. Um... And we're kind of acting on as a as a as a basis. Um, so it was interesting to see that actually the data stands up to that. We have very, very few of them. Um, now um, let's sing. Um, someone says, "Could the shield with the single wheel be for someone called Turner?" Um, yes, possibly. Um, the one with the ah, the shield with the single wheel. Yes. So the um, the by name of that particular example um, is Will William, and then we have Arlel, so A R L E L. The first letter is very confusing, so I'd be happy to take opinions on it. Um, but yes, we do um, occasionally have um, CMHCs with puns, um, as we see plenty of south of the border as well. Um, so yes, I, I think the distinction that I've been working on, and I think is a fair distinction, is that if it's a wheel that has got clearly clearly got spikes or blades coming out of it, I think that's a very particular type of wheel. And I think the association is immediate to St. Catherine. Um, but I'm happy to have those conversations. Right. Now, uh, Rachel Hart asks, do you have any plans to search archival collections to find impressions made with your matrices? Could your new web resource be used to bring such impressions together with their matrices? Mm. So there is a wonderful web resource called People of Medieval Scotland, which um, digitizes archival data, including some seal impressions, um, which is my go to at the moment um, if I'm trying to find an individual. Um, there are no big plans at the moment, um, mostly owing to we've not had discussions about funding yet. Um, this is very much the, the beginning of, of the research. So it's very much kind of synthesizing the data and just trying to get it out there to start with. But I think long-term is an excellent idea. 
Right. Well, um, I wish we had a um, people of medi medieval England and uh, uh, database we could just go to. It would be abs abs absolutely marvellous. But thank you very much for your you. uh, uh, talk. It was ex excellent. The, um, there are one or two other questions, but I won't deal with them. You can deal with them, you know, your, yourself.